So, so great to meet together. Uh, today, actually, we're starting a, a new series uh, called Heroes. We're going to focus on different uh, heroes that are, that are found uh, in the Bible. Avengers is over, so we, we thought we would uh, do our part. Um, I guess the slash name would be like Restorers or something like that. Um, yeah, so we're going to look at a, a bunch of heroes in the Bible, and, and just I, I really hope that, that, first of all, we just learn about these characters, these, these heroes of the Bible, but then also get inspired uh, by them, uh, maybe learn from their mistakes. I love how the Bible is real, right? It, it includes uh, heroes in the Bible, but it doesn't blot out the parts that, uh, where they fail, where they make mistakes, and, and that we can learn from. And so today, I'm going to talk about a hero who had on his heart to build uh, a wall. Um, not Donald Trump. It's, uh, <laughs> it's Nehemiah. So uh, yeah, let's just, let's just pray before we get into stuff. And Yeah, God, thank you so much for who you are. You are, you're amazing and you are awesome. And as we look at uh, this hero series, we just want to recognize that, uh, Jesus, you're, you're number one. You, you're, you are our Superman. You're our, you're our Savior. And God, we put our trust in you, and we thank you uh, for everything you've done for us. And God, uh, thank you that we're here together. I, I really believe that you just want to do something special in each heart today. And, and that is only something that happens when your spirit moves and your spirit speaks to our hearts and your spirit illuminates what we're talking about and makes it come to life. So God, I just pray that that would happen this morning, that we would meet you, we would experience your spirit and your love, and, um, and you would speak to us very clearly. God, we just say yes to that right now. We say yes to uh, what you want to say specifically to our hearts. Yeah, amen. Awesome. So before I just start reading uh, this Nehemiah's story and get into, we're just going to kind of unpack the story uh, almost from start to finish anyway, pretty much from start to finish, leaving out a few spots. Um, but I just wanted to give you a little snapshot of what is happening uh, in, in this story, in this, in this timeline. Uh, and so in, in 587, you have Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, being destroyed uh, by Babylon. So the temple is destroyed, the city is burnt and destroyed. Um, and Babylon, this is where Babylon takes uh, those in Jerusalem uh, into exile. The best, they take the best, right? And the others in Jerusalem are under uh, Bab Babylonian kind of captivity there. Uh, then then in 539, uh, Persia, the empire of Persia, uh, rises up and conquers Babylon. And, and shortly after that, 50,000 um, of, of those Jews that, that were taken are brought back to Jerusalem, one of them being Zerubbabel. And, and here is where they, they start rebuilding the temple of God that was destroyed. And, and they rebuild the temple, uh, but Jerusalem is still kind of uh, in, in shambles. It, it's, this is around, you know... Um, you know, a after the temple was rebuilt, 70 years later, the wall walls of Jerusalem are still in shambles. And uh, so this is where we're going to pick up the story this morning. So Nehemiah 1. In the month of Kinslev, and that's November slash December, uh, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanai, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men and questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived exile, and also about Jerusalem. Uh, so Nehemiah is in Persia during this time, and, and he's serving the king as a, as a cupbearer, and, so and where he was was approximately 1,300 kilometers away, so it would have been around here to Edmonton, and so he wasn't able to go on Google and, and TripAdvisor and look up how things are right now in Jerusalem. So he had no idea what was happening in, in Jerusalem at this time. So he's just generally asking, like, what is going on in Jerusalem? There were some people that went back there, some people exiled. What's happening? So he doesn't even know. Um, and so they, they said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province. Uh, they are in great trouble and distress. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burnt with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. 
Uh, the first thing that, that I want to take from the story uh, and, and just kind of talk about what heroes do, heroes take ownership of problems. A hero takes ownership of problems. And if you want to be a hero of faith, you, I, I really think you've got to take ownership of some problems that are on God's heart. And, and we can look at the world and, and really fast, like, you know, you, you scroll through Facebook or your news feed really fast, you realize there are, are a lot of needs, Right? There are many, 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 many needs, and, and, and sometimes it's, it's, a lot of times it's overwhelming. It's like, how, how do I care for all of these things? How, what, what do I do, God? And, and you can almost let it overwhelm you to the point where you just disengage, and, and you just don't know what to do anymore. But, but, I, but I really specifically feel um, that, that God is going to put certain burdens on your heart, specific burdens, specific things that are on God's heart, problems to God. He's going to put um, just a burden for you to pray about those, to care about those, to take action, um, to, to bring restoration in people's lives and in situations. And, and I, I really trust that, that this is something that, that God can do in our hearts. Because we are called to care about all, uh, like, all these problems and pray about all these problems. But again, I think Holy Spirit does a really good job of highlighting it in people's hearts, um, certain situations and certain problems that need restoration. And even in the story of Nehemiah here, you have a bunch of heroes that are chosen by God to be part of, of Jerusalem's restoration. You have Zerubbabel that, that had on his heart to rebuild the temple. And you have Ezra that actually was kind of in charge of, of bringing the people back into following the law and spiritual care. And you have Nehemiah who has on his heart to restore the wall. So again, God chooses heroes to bring Jerusalem back into restoration. And, and I think in, in Winkler and, and beyond in this world, God chooses heroes from the church to carry ownership of, of the things on God's heart. And, and when we do that, we, we can together bring restoration right? And I think that's a, an amazing thing. And, and so that's what heroes do. Heroes take ownership of the problems that are on God's heart. And I, I find the story so amazing because Nehemiah didn't have to care about the wall as much as he did, right? He lived 1,300 kilometers away. I looked that up on Google Maps. It's quite the walk. <laughs> it's, it's a ways. And, and he lives 1,300 kilometers away, and he's also in, in the palace as a cupbearer, and he's the king's property. He, he's not really allowed just to say, yo, king, uh, peace out, I'm gonna go rebuild the wall. That, that, it doesn't work that way, and so Nehemiah has a lot of excuses to disengage and say, you know what, this isn't my problem. I, I, I don't know, I'm just gonna disengage. But, but the beautiful thing is that even though he's in the palace, even though he has has a cushy job, a prestigious job as a cupbearer. His job was to sip wine and then give it to the king. Kind of to test it if it had poison, but, but, but still it was known as, as a good job. He had a good job, he had all his needs met, he had all the food that he wanted, and he was in the comfort of the palace 1,300 kilometers away, yet he feels a burden for the people of Israel, even though he's not the one in danger, even though they're the one in danger. They're the one that, that city is destroyed. They're the one that are being attacked by, by enemies because their walls are down. They're the vulnerable. They're the broken. And he has this cushy life. And he takes ownership of this problem. And, and I think in the same way, we need, to, we need to engage, right? Some of us, we, like, if I'm just taking my example, I have a pretty cushy life. I have a, I have a wonderful house. I have a, a car that drives, um, I, I have a wife, I, I have, I have given, been given so much and it can be easy to, to disengage from problems that are happening around me. It can be easy to say, hey, I've got it good, I'm going to pray about these things, but I don't know if I need to take ownership because they're not my problems. And, and you know, I, I love when this, uh, I guess it was maybe a uh, a month ago about, we did a, uh, an event called Love the Valley where we were bringing uh, hampers to those in need. And, th and there was one couple that came back and they kind of shared their testimony. But they could, you could see on their face, they, they entered this home with a hamper and, and, and you just kind of saw, they, they just kind of saw a brokenness. 
a family that was kind of in, in shambles and a situation that, that was just an, uh, a mess and you just saw the burden on their heart as they came back because, because we live in Winkler and, and Morden, right? It can be easy to look at our situation and be like, wow, you know, there's not a lot of need. And, and I, I love the fact that, that they, they, they saw this, that they brought this hamper. They said that the, the house they went to looked great, but it was so broken on the inside and there was so much need at, at that house. And I, and I think in the same way, we have to be careful that, that just because we lo- live in a community that looks really beautiful, there is a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of need, and I need to, I need to choose to engage uh, and, and bring restoration and bring help and take ownership of, of some of the problems that are happening in my community or not in my community in Nehemiah's case. And lately I've heard just stories of, of people that ended up, you know, just just through situations, praying with someone in need, praying with someone who's broken, and then just beginning to walk with them, beginning to text them, encourage them, and and just just help them to come to a place of of restoration. And and in my heart, I was just so encouraged. I think I heard this this week, and I was just so encouraged because that is what a hero is all about. That's what a hero is all about. It's, It's not their broken situation. It's, it's not their problem, but they're taking ownership of it, and they're saying, hey, no, I, I'm going to be someone who's going to help restore what's broken, and that's what a hero does. And, and so Nehemiah, in, in the same way, when he hears about the walls of Jerusalem being burnt down, he was burdened with this, and, and he begins to pray this prayer in Nehemiah 1. And it's this powerful prayer. He says, Then I said, Lord, uh, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps this covenant of love with those who love him and keeps his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer that your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands and decrees and laws that you gave to your servant Moses. And so here you have Nehemiah praying this prayer of intercession. And when you pray a a prayer of intercession, you're kind of praying not just about a situation, but you're praying, Nehemiah's praying the like he's part of this situation. He's taking ownership of this problem in his prayer. He's, he's confessing sins on behalf of himself, his family, and the Israelites. And, 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 and for six months, he continues to do this. This is not just a prayer. He just didn't fast and, and cry for a couple days. It was escalated for that couple of days. But, but between the time that Nehemiah heard this news and the time that he actually visited Jerusalem was six months. And, and he, he just chose to, to carry this burden of intercession uh, and, and fasting for his people for six months. And I, I truly believe that if we uh, choose to do that, as God puts a burden on our heart for people, or a burden on our heart uh, to intercede, to really, to really pray about things in a powerful way, if we choose to carry that burden, it's going to lead to action, right? Right? There, there's no way Nehemiah is just continuing to pray for six months and he's going to be satisfied with, with just his palace and his situation. No, his prayer uh, is paving the way for what God wants to do. And, and six months later, Nehemiah, he continues to serve as a cupbearer. And, and one morning, um, he has a heavy heart. He's still thinking about his people. He's still thinking about Jerusalem in shambles. And he, and he comes to the king with, with a heavy heart. And the king asks him, Nehemiah, you, you look bummed out. And Nehemiah says, well, yeah, I, I am. I'm, my, the, my people, Jerusalem, their, their city, the walls have been burnt. And, 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 and they're in shambles. And, and with your permission, I, I would want to go there and rebuild the walls. And Nehemiah takes a great risk when he does this. Because when he asks, um, have any of you ever asked your boss for some extra vacation time? This is a little bit um, escalated from that because he belonged to the king, right? He, he was the king's cupbearer. Who was going to sip the wine if he was gone, right, to protect the king? And, and so he asked the king, and this request could have gotten him killed, but he asked the king with, with fear and trembling, and he prays before he does. He asked the king, and, and miraculously, the king gives him permission to leave 
But not only that, he, he, he gives them uh, an army uh, to escort them on his way. He gives them supplies to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So he arrives in Jerusalem, starts walking around, just taking note uh, of, of the, the mess. I don't know what he's writing down. It's like there's a rock here, rock here, rock here. It's a mess. Once he's done that and surveyed the situation, he gets the people of Jerusalem around and, and, and he, he rallies them together to build this wall. It, it was a big wall, 12 feet high, 8 feet wide around the whole city. So it's not a small project, but the people uh, are pumped. They're excited to rebuild the wall. Again, they've tried. They tried previously. It didn't work. But now they're excited again. And we're going to pick up the story uh, in Nehemiah 4. Nehemiah 4, it says, Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage. I don't know what that looks like, but he was angry. He flew into a rage, mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and, and the Samaritan army officers, what does this poor bunch of feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build a wall in a single day by offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of the stones from a rubbleless sheep and charred ones at that? Tobiah the Amorite, who was standing beside him, remarked, that stone wall could collapse if even a fox walked on top of it. And then I prayed, hear us, our God, for we're being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads. May they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Don't ignore their guilt. Don't blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. At last the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. But Sanbala, Tobiah, the Arabs, and, and the Amorites, the people of Ashud, Ashdod, heard that the repairs of the Jerusalem walls had gone ahead and the gaps were beginning to close. They were very angry. They plotted all together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. And meanwhile, the people of Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is much rubble, that there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. And and you know, I think this is so relatable. When, when we're rebuilding things that, that, are, that are broken uh, in our, our own life or other people's lives, it's often halfway through that the struggle starts, right? And, and it's the same way with the people of Jerusalem. They, they enter into this, this big situation. They're excited uh, about the wall. They're excited to build the wall. And it's halfway through. When they get halfway, all of a sudden they, they start hearing the threats. They start hearing the voices. And they start looking at the rubble. And they say, we, we can't do it. There, there's, there's just too much. And, and I, I think in the same way, we are people that give up when we're halfway through, Right? When we're halfway through getting so to something, we're people that, that, that give up. I, can, I, can, I probably can't count on two hands how many books I'm halfway through. It's easy to give up when we're halfway through, but this is when heroes find strength in God. And so it says, Also our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them, and we will kill them and put an end to the work. So now it's not only, um, they're not only being dissed, saying their wall is weak, they're actually being threatened with their lives. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. And therefore I stationed some people behind the lowest points of the wall and exposed places, posting them by their families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. And the second thing we see that, that heroes do in this story is heroes do not give up. Heroes do not give up. Why don't they give up? It, it's really clear. Every, every single time, it's so cool. If you look at it, every time there's, there's a threat against their wall, there's a threat against the people, um, or, or there's something holding uh, the people back, or the people are in disbelief, Nehemiah immediately turns to God. You know, it says the stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked on top of it, and then Nehemiah prays, Hear us, our God, for we're being mocked. They plotted together to come and fight against us. 
against Jerusalem and stir up trouble, but we prayed to our God. It says, and then when everyone else was about to give up, Nehemiah says, don't be afraid. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. In Nehemiah 6, when the people were getting fatigued and they were getting tired, it says they were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will grow too weak for the work and, we will not be, and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. So every obstacle that, that Nehemiah met, and, and, and it, if you're doing anything of value, anything worthwhile, you're going to meet obstacles, Right? There's going to be times where you're you're fatigued. There's going to be an enemy, an opposition. There's going to be voices of doubt that come into your head from yourself or other people or the enemy. And every time when you're faced with opposition, uh, heroes don't give up because they find strength in God. They find strength in turning to God in that situation. And I know it probably just sounds cliche, and it probably sounds simple, but cliches are true uh, because or cliches are used because they're true, right? Cliches are used because often they work, and this is what Nehemiah does every time. Every time there's a threat, every time they're, they're mocking, he, he always goes and turns to God, and he turns to God, and he turns to God, and the people aren't believing, and he turns them to God. Remember our great and awesome God. And this is where we as, as people, as whatever we're doing, that where we need perseverance, we have to do the same thing. We have to find strength in God by turning to him. I love when it says in Ephesians, finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. It, it doesn't say finally, be strong and in your mighty power. You know, it doesn't say that. It says be strong where? You can do better. Be strong and in Be strong where? In the Lord and his mighty power. Doesn't say you have to be strong. Doesn't say you have to be mighty. It just says, "Hey, there's strength in the Lord. The Lord is not giving up." The Lord is, has still hope. The Lord still has strength. And, and there's this story in, in the story of David um, where, where there's, a, there's a point where, you know, the, the families of, of his army were, were taken captive and, and by the enemy and people were about to, to stone David. They were threatening to stone him. And it simply says David found strength in the Lord. David found strength in the Lord. And th- we, we have to get better at that if, if we want to do anything of worthwhile value. Um, if, if we want to live lives where we don't go halfway through and then give up, we have to be able to find strength in God. And I really believe that we do that just as we turn to God in everything. Whenever we hear a voice of doubt, God, you hear that voice of doubt, and God, I, I just submit that to you. Thank you that you're sustaining me, you're with me today, and you're giving me strength. And this is where we're, we're going to find that strength in God. This is where God is going to sustain us. God is going to see us through because God never runs out of strength. God never runs out of hope. God never runs out. And, and we need to learn to not give up by finding our strength in God. And that's what Nehemiah and, and, and the, the Jews did in Jerusalem. And that's how they rebuilt the wall. And so 52 days later, the wall is done. Wow, 52 days. What Israel um, couldn't do for 75 years, Nehemiah comes and 52 days later, it's done. He's pretty much the Kawhi Leonard of Judah. Raptors couldn't win, he comes for one season and they win a championship. And, and so Nehemiah is promoted as, as governor. Um, he's, he's promoted to governor and, um, and, and this is where I think Sometimes I've missed this part of the story, but I think it's so important to focus on it because it was the norm as the governor to tax your people. It, that was just the norm. It was actually just expected that if you were governor, you were taxing the people and, and filling your pockets a little bit. And some of that money was actually used for, for different things. So it was just expected. And so it says in Nehemiah 5, and this I think is, uh, is such a key part of the story, The early governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people. And so governors, they would tax the people and their assistants would tax the people. 
But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. And I think this is amazing, because Nehemiah could have came. He was a hero. He rebuilt the wall. In 52 days, he rebuilt the wall. And this is where I think Nehemiah could have just had this attitude of, show me the money. Like, show me the money. Like, I I deserve this. I deserve a plot of land. I deserve some food. I deserve some wine. I'm doing all of this work for you people. You people were helpless until I came. And I'm going to throw myself a championship parade. I'm going to throw myself, you know, I'm going to take some of that money. And and Nehemiah said, no, we were here for the work of the wall. And furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table as well as those who came to us from surrounding nations. And each day, this is where Nehemiah is giving his grocery list of what he had to spend. Each day, one ox, six sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me, and eat every 10 days an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. So the governors, they had to throw these parties at their own expense. When, when officials would come, they would throw, you know, 150 people this party with, with the sirloins, with lamb chops, and with chicken breasts. And, and, and Nehemiah is still saying, in spite of all of this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor. This was coming out of his own bill. Because the demands on the people were too heavy. Remember me with favor, my God, for all I have done for these people. And I think, I've read Nehemiah, the story of Nehemiah, so many times, but sometimes I forget, I've forgotten, and I've just kind of glazed over this part. And I think this is, this is such a key part to the story of Nehemiah, because he could have came and served Israel and built a wall and made himself a statue, and all of a sudden he's not a hero anymore. All of a sudden, he's just someone that that, that becomes a hero in the eyes of man instead of becoming a hero in the eyes of God. And Nehemiah simply prays at the end of this verse, Remember me with favor, my God, for all I have done to these people. And and I just, um, the third point that heroes aren't uh, today is heroes aren't entitled. Heroes are not entitled. They're, They're not here to build their own kingdom. They're they're not here to build their own name. They're they're not here to acquire land. They're they're, they're here for the work that the Lord has set out for them. And I think this could be such a slippery slope, right? How many of you have been entitled ever? Don't raise your hand. (laughs) It's all of us. It's such a slippery slope because we can have good intentions of helping out. And we can have good intentions of loving people and working for the Lord, but then we want something back. Like, I'm I'm free to be generous as long as a lot of people see it. (laughs) I'm free to serve God as as long as I get a huge, big thank you. I I, want to love this person, but but you know what? If, If they don't show appreciation for me, I'm out. And this is where we have to be so careful that we recognize that we're just here to do the work of the Lord. That's it. You know, there's this parable in Matthew 20. Jesus talks about where, where he hires a, a labor, laborers at the beginning of the day. He, they decide for a wage of the day, and the laborer's like, yeah, that's a fair wage. I'm going to work for that wage. And the last hour, he hires a bunch more people. Um, and, and at the end of the day, they all get together, and, and they're about to get their wages for the day. And all of a sudden, that the people that worked all day realized that the people at the last hour got the same wage. And they had sweat on their face, and they were sunburned, and they were mad. They were like, I worked. I slaved, and they're getting the same wage as me? They're getting the same thing as me? That This isn't fair. And again, in the same way, we can, we can work for God. We can labor for God, but, but, but if we're caught up with building our own kingdom, if we're caught up with just wanting recognition from people or, or, or wanting back something extra, then, then we're not heroes. We're doing it for our own selfish gain. You know, I, you know it, it's a wild passage where it says, I can give all I have to the poor, but if I have not love, I'm a clanging gong. And that 
is, is just wild. And, and I've been in fault there. I've done ministry where, where I've poured out, I, I, I've given and I've wanted something back. I, I've wanted recognition back. But, but, but this is where Nehemiah so shows it so well. It says, instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. And I want this just to be a verse that sticks in my heart. That I'm here to build the wall. Whatever your wall is, whatever your calling is, whatever, whatever God has put on your life as your assignment to do, that's what you're here to build. You're not here to build a name for yourself. You're not here to get recognized. You're not here to acquire land. You're, you're here for what God has put you on this earth to do. And that's to build his kingdom and not your own. And for me, this is a constant battle because I want self-recognition. I'm a three enneagram, achiever. But I have to remember that if I'm building my own kingdom here, then, then I've, I've lost everything. And I'm no longer serving God, I'm just serving myself. In 2 Timothy, it says, No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. And that's what I want my focus to be. Whatever God says, I don't want to get caught in the civilian affairs. Whatever my commanding officer is saying, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be known for. So as we finish the story, what's Nehemiah's next move? The wall is built. He's governor. His next move, hopefully it's not Kawhi Leonard's, is he leaves. He leaves Jerusalem and he puts other people in charge. He says, you're, you're godly, you're godly, you can be put in charge. And he leaves for 10 years, and 10 years later, he comes back, and guess what? Jerusalem's in shambles. The wall is built, the temple is built, but, but, but the temple duties aren't being carried out, tithes aren't coming in, the Sabbath isn't being respected, it's, it, it's a mess. And, and at this point, this is where I would probably get, give up. You know, I, I would probably have an attitude, wow, I come in, I rebuild a wall for you, and, and this is what I come back to. But Nehemiah, he, he just simply gets back to work, and he starts cleaning house, he starts making sure the ties are coming in, he starts closing the gates at the, the, at the Sabbath, and he pours time and resources into helping the people of Jerusalem. And, and, and you see his motive in the last chapter of Nehemiah. You see his motive so clearly as he prays this prayer that he's already prayed in whatever that chapter was. And we're going to read that for you. Nehemiah 13 verse 14. It says, Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my Lord God and its services. And Nehemiah 13, 22, remember me for this also, my God, and show me mercy according to your great love. In the very end of the book, this is the very end here, and it says, so I purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign. I assigned them duties each to his own task. I also made provision for contributions of wood and designated times and for the first fruit. So he's pouring resources and resources and resources. And he says, remember me with favor, my God, the end. That's, that's the end of Nehemiah. That's the end of his story. And I think that's such a beautiful motivation because I, I think real, real heroes are motivated to be remembered by God. And that motivates them throughout their life. Do any of you ever think about when you're, when you're dead and your funeral? Do you ever think about that? I sometimes do, and I think about the legacy I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave behind and how everyone's going to be like just, just a wreck, you know? They're just, they're just going to be crying, oh, he was such a good guy. He did so much. He was a hero. And you know, you, you think about your tombstone, what's going to be written on it. And it's just going to be a Brenton hero. Amazing. Number one dude. <laughs> but I, I really was convicted in reading Nehemiah that, that I, I, I never really think about standing before God and what he's going to say about me. How he is going to remember me. Because the truth is that heroes are sometimes remembered by people, but they're always remembered by God. And honestly, I just, had, I just had to repent all over and again. And I, I just had to say, God, help me, help that to be my motivation. 
Help that to be my calling on earth, that I'm here to build the, the wall that you have for me. I'm here to fulfill this purpose that you have for me and nothing else. I'm not here for my own glory. I'm not here for my own fame. I'm here to be remembered by you. I'm here to be a hero in your eyes, not other people's eyes. Amen? Awesome. I'll call the worship team up. And can we just pray uh, this morning together? Hmm. Yeah, God, I, I, I just thank you that you're, you're calling us to be heroes. And, and, and everyone's story is going to be different. And everyone, everyone's burden, every, every person who, they're, what they're called to restore is different. But God, together we can, we can just be heroes and, and we can do something great as we respond to the call on our lives together. And God, I, I just pray that, that we would be people that would persevere. I pray that, that we'd be people that when the going gets tough, we turn to you. We don't try to grit our teeth. We just turn to you and say, God, I need your strength. God, strengthen my hands. They're getting weak. God, you hear the mocking. You hear the voices of disbelief. But, but God, help me. You are great and awesome, and you are for me. And God, just as a church of, of GMC and a people as GMC, may we just be known for building the wall that you have for us to build. God, we, are, we, we just declare that we are not here to build our reputation. We are not here to build popularity. We, we are here for the task that you sent us. So God, I, I just pray uh, and, and we just repent for sometimes, you know, getting caught in civilian affairs when we're, well, you put us here for a purpose and a reason to build your kingdom, to be consumed with your kingdom to be burdened by your problems, God, and not just focusing on our own. We're just gonna pray uh, about three things uh, before we go. The first thing, I, I, you know, as Nehemiah was burdened for, for the city of Jerusalem, like I said, I, I really believe that Holy Spirit wants to burden us with things that are on His heart. And maybe some of these things you've already been burdened for, but maybe you've kind of not taken ownership of it. Maybe you've kind of let it just slide away and you've forgotten about the need. Or maybe there's gonna be a new burden on your heart today that Holy Spirit's gonna light up. But, but Holy Spirit, I, I just pray this morning that, that whatever you want our hearts to be burdened for, whatever you've, you've called us to rebuild, whether it's someone's life or a situation, God, I, I just pray that in our hearts right now, you just implant that burning. You would implant a, a burden that you have and you want us to do something about, you want us to pray about, you want us to intercede for, you want us to take action with. God, I just pray sovereignly that that would happen this morning that you would put on our hearts what you want us to be burdened for. Hmm. And, and another thing I wanna pray about is maybe some of you, you're halfway through something and, and you're ready to give up. Maybe you're rebuilding something in your life and you're looking at the rubble and you're hearing the, the voices of doubt and you're fatigued and you're just saying, there's, there's too much, I can't do it. And the beauty is you can't, but God can. And, and this morning, if that's you and you're in a situation where you're feeling like giving up, just as a sign uh, of saying yes to, to finding strength in God, just as a sign of saying, God, I need your help, just raise your hand. Not raising it to me, but just raising it to God and say, God, I need your help. God, I'm weak, I'm tired, I, I can't do this. I'm turning to you. I'm turning for your help. Yeah, and God, I thank you for everyone whose hands are raised right now. God, I just pray supernaturally that you'd give them strength. God, I pray that you'd give them the grace to turn to you, to tap into your strength, to tap into your hope, and to tap into your love. Hmm. Yes. And lastly, just one more thing. If you're living entitled right now and you're living to build your own kingdom, and you're just realizing that and you, you just want to repent and say, God, I, I don't want to be here to build my kingdom anymore. 
I want to be here to fulfill the assignment that you have for me. And I repent. If that's you, just raise your hand. Just as a symbol, God, I repent. I want to be here to build your wall, not anything else. Hmm, Yeah, thank you for your hands. Awesome. So good. Yeah, Holy Spirit, would you strengthen us today? Would you just sow this this seed that's been planted in our heart? And I just pray that it would grow so that we can be heroes in this world um, and restore things that are broken and restore the things that you've called us to. Amen.